Mr. Morehouse, recognized. Thank you to the chairman and the committee for inviting me here today. I will be summarizing my written testimony for you. There have been 400 cases of U.S. children kidnapped to Japan since 1994. The Japanese government has returned zero children. On behalf of the 71 kidnapped children listed on the Back Home website who have been rendered voiceless by their abductors, for my fellow parents of internationally kidnapped children who feel marginalized by the lack of active, engaged, transparent assistance from the Office of Children's Issues in recovering their loved ones, I implore Congress to ensure that the Department of State finds Japan non-compliant and imposes sanctions under the Goldman Act. <coughs> One year ago next week, at the very moment Japan acceded to the Hague Abduction Convention, parents joined together to hand deliver with us 30 applications for access under Article 21. This was supposed to be an efficient path to see our children again, though we parents may have applied for access under Article 21, as we were encouraged to do so by the Department of State, our collective cases remain abduction cases. Over the past 12 months, the Office of Children's Issues time and again insisted that we must give Japan time. We must wait and see. Well, we've waited and we've seen. None of the back home parents have received any access to their children. Japan's implementation of the, gold, of the Hague Abduction Convention is an abysmal failure. Sanctions under the Goldman Act will provide some of the necessary public pressure on Japan to create change in this ongoing human and family rights crisis. It's crucial that members of Congress be made aware of the first Hague Article 21 access case to make it through the Japanese family court process. This case is typical of what parents are encountering in their attempts to gain access to their kidnapped children. Under Article 21, the central authorities are bound to promote peaceful enjoyment of access rights and fulfillment of any conditions to which the exercise of those rights may be subject. The central authorities shall take steps to remove, as far as possible, all obstacles to the exercise of such rights. Now, instead of removing obstacles, the Japanese government has erected multiple barriers interfering with the exercise of parental rights. These actions are prejudicial and designed to prevent victimized parents from gaining access to his or her children. The actions by the court in this pioneer case include, one, a request by Henrik Teton for interim access to his children under the Hague, which was ignored by the court. And two, the judge walked out of the room when the father who was representing himself asked questions of the court. And three, the father who was denied the use of his own translator was forced to use a court-appointed translator with no ability to ensure that the translations were accurate. Number four, the judge refused to provide his name, therefore making accountability of his rulings impossible. And five, the judge ruled that no observers, including embassy officials, were allowed to witness the proceedings. In my written testimony, I will also outline what some of the other parents have faced in their failed attempts to gain access. Now, in consulting with Japanese lawyers, it's become very clear to back home that Japan's implementation provides no reasonable, enforceable means for victimized parents to access or obtain the return of their children. They are simply violating the Hague Abduction Convention and non-compliant as a country under the Goldman Act. There are numerous clear-cut cases of abduction, uh, such as Paul Toland and Paul Wong. Though they're both the only living parent, the grandparents in Japan are holding their daughters from them. There are cases like Randy Collins, whose ex-wife was ordered to surrender the child's passport to the court, and instead she kidnapped him. Douglas Burgess' children were kidnapped from their habitual and legal residence in the United States, in 2009, violating his parental rights to access. And Christopher Savoy's ex-wife violated the divorce decree, 
state, and federal statutes when she kidnapped their children. Now, in my own case, I was granted primary custody of my son in the state of Washington in May of 2007. Three years later, in June of 2010, I dropped my son Mochi off to begin a week-long visit with his mother. He was six and a half years old. This is where my endless nightmare began. Six days later, I received a phone call that no parent wants to receive. It was the police. My son and ex-wife had been reported missing. I knew immediately what had happened. She had succeeded in what she had intended on doing, which was kidnapping him to Japan. In that moment, my life was shattered. My days would become consumed with dealing with local law enforcement, the U.S. Department of State, Japanese consular officials, and anything I could think of to try and find my boy. Now, how could this happen to my child? I did everything I could think of to prevent this. There were even passport and travel restraints in the court order which barred her from leaving the state of Washington with him. Well, I came to learn the hard way that restraints are only effective if somebody is willing to abide by them. For someone intending to commit kidnapping, restraints have true little power. When the Seattle Consulate of Japan denied my ex-wife's attempt to obtain a passport, she simply went to the consulate in Portland, and they issued her one in violation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs passport issuance policy. And some people over the past several years have said to me, well, you know, at least you know where he is. He's safe with his mother. But he's not safe. He is at risk. She has willingly and intentionally kidnapped him to a foreign land with the intent of permanently alienating him from me and everyone he knows. Now imagine, just for a minute, being a child and your mother steals you away to a foreign country tells you your father doesn't want you anymore or that he's dead. Your whole life is now built on a foundation of lies. This is not what a healthy parent does. This is child abuse. Every morning I, I wake up twice. <laughs> First time, I have this feeling I have to rush out of bed and get my son ready for school, and I can hear his voice, and he's saying, Daddy, can I have toast and honey for breakfast? And I have to get him ready for school. And then my heart skips a beat, <laughs> and I wake up for real, and I realize he's still missing. And the nightmare continues. The last time I held his hand, the last time I heard my son's voice, was on Father's Day of 2010. Well, last year in my case, I won a landmark ruling in Japan where the court acknowledged my US custody order and recognized me as the sole custodial parent under Japanese law. My ex-wife has no legal custody rights there. They also cited her admission of committing illegal acts under Japanese law in order to, to abduct my son. However, they're still not telling me where he is. He's still being held captive. Private backroom diplomacy has, has failed. It's failed to return my son and any of the other kidnapped American children. Public statements by Secretary Kerry, Ambassador Kennedy, and President Obama could have meaningful, meaningful effect. But to date, we've only heard silence. Without, uh, it's been Congress that has led the charge on this abduction crisis with Japan. And I urge members of Congress to ensure that the Department of State finds Japan non-compliant and that sanctions are imposed under the Goldman Act. Without public consequences, there will be no incentive for Japan to change. It will remain a black hole for child abduction. 
Now is the time for Japan to demonstrate they are serious about changing course on this ongoing crisis of international parental child abduction. Next month, Prime Minister Abe will come visit Congress and address Congress here in Washington. In addition to noncompliance and sanctions, I'm here to ask Congress to tell the Prime Minister that it's not acceptable to continue to hold Mochi, Otomu, Emoto, Morehouse, or any of the 400 kidnapped American children anymore. Thank you for your time today. Mr. Morehouse, thank you <clears throat> very much for your very moving testimony.